So let's see if we can apply the Bohr model to a few uh, interesting examples and, and see if uh, see how well it explains the uh, behavior. So first of all, I'd like to take a look at um, fluorescent lights. So fluorescent lights are tubes uh, used in, 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 in houses and things to, to provide light for people. And uh, let's, let's just see. So inside a fluorescent light, we got a tube. I'm drawing a cross section here. Uh, there's the, the tube, okay? And you may know, in fact, that there's actually mercury inside. So if you ever break a fluorescent tube, you should be very careful to clean it up thoroughly. So there's the mercury in there, and then there's a voltage that actually accelerates some electrons. So the electrons accelerate along, and then they hit these um, mercury nuclei, uh, or uh, atoms, I mean, sorry. And if we sketch really quickly here our, our Bohr model, and the Bohr model, I'm, I'm, ex I'm being a little bit broad in my usage, technically should just be a one electron atom, but this is the, the, the structure of the atom being where the electrons are defined only by principal quantum number. Okay, so n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on. And so we've got a little uh, electron sitting or spinning around at a, at a particular, in a particular shell. Right, we had this shell idea. <clears throat> so what happens is this electron hits uh, the, the atom of mercury, um, it accelerates up, and it has, the electron has enough energy to cause an excitation um, in, of that electron from one shell to another. I'm just drawing, you know, n equals one, n equals two. Um, but it, it, it actually, it, it can, it causes an excitation, it excites electrons, and then the electron can subsequently, well, will, in fact, subsequently drop back down. And we know when it drops back down, it gives off a little quanta of energy, a photon, with energy E equals H uh, C over lambda. <clears throat> now, the, the, these electrons in, in the fluorescent tube are excited actually quite a bit, and there's a number of different transitions that can occur. We can have a transition down, uh, you know, a variety of different transitions, and each one giving off different quanta from even higher uh, energies or ionized um, completely, potentially. So. Anyway, I'm not wanting to get into too much of the specifics of which transitions occur, rather that we appreciate we've excited an electron, and as they drop back down, they give off quanta of energy. They give off these photons. And so that's not quite the end of the story there, because we want to make sure that these photons are in the visible spectrum. We, we want to light a house or something or an office building, so we need uh, visible photons visible, that is visible to humans. And it turns out that the transitions that are caused to occur in mercury are actually in the ultraviolet. So let me pick a color close to that that uh, we'll still be able to see. So I'm gonna make it blue just for, just for kicks, right? So there's a photon um, uh, in, the, in the ultraviolet range of the spectrum. Now that's not really any good to us because it'll give us a sunburn and we won't be able to see what we're trying to read. So we need to somehow convert that ultraviolet photon into a photon that we can see with our human eyes. And so you may notice if you've looked at a fluorescent tube, it has this sort of a translucent um, coating on it. It looks like there's some white paint on the inside of the tube. In fact, there is. It's actually, it's called a phosphor and it's this is this chemical that absorbs in a certain range of the spectrum and then readmits in another range. So particular the phosphors, there's a variety of different ones and they can be carefully controlled in their chemistry to give exactly the light uh, that you want. But they absorb in the ultraviolet and then they readmit in the visible. So again they have photon energy, HC over lambda, but in the visible spectrum. And so that's fantastic. We've we've got the this light coming off of these tubes now, and we can see um, with our with our, our our naked eyes. And that's a it's a great little example of all these transitions that are occurring. Uh, and the Bohr model is in fact facilitating that understanding. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you another example actually of this mechanism I discussed with the phosphors. Um, you you that, that you can actually almost see with with your naked eye, if you will. And that's um, uh, a fluorescent marker, uh, or, or highlighter, I mean. 
So if you, you know, see, I'll draw a piece of paper here. Okay, there we go, there's a paper, and on that paper, um, perhaps uh, you got, okay, there's some writing, right? It's a really interesting piece of paper. And then you say, well, this, this little section right here is particularly interesting. So you get a highlighter, a marker, um, that's kind of transparent, has this transparent fluorescent ink. So you've used a highlighter on it. Well, if you've ever looked at a white piece of paper with some highlighter on it, particularly on an overcast day, so say you're outside, you're looking at a piece of paper with some highlighter on it. Let me draw this for you. So here's the sun. I'm going to make the sun white because it has the full uh, range of colors in it. And um, say I said it's an overcast day, so I'm going to draw a cloud in there. There's a cloud, okay? And it's interesting, that what happens is a lot of the ultraviolet radiation, I'm actually just to be consistent, I'm gonna make it blue so it reminds us that it's in the ultraviolet, gets through the, the clouds. But of course our eyes, our human eyes, are not tuned to ultraviolet as we discussed. So they adjust to the fact that less light is getting through the, the, the clouds and it seems darker to us. So our um, irises open up and, and we, we're getting in a lot of uh, photons that are hitting our our, um, our retina and the the ultraviolet is not being detected but this highlighter the dyes in the highlighter are absorbing photons in the ultraviolet and then they're re-emitting photons in the visible they're re-emitting visible photons and of course we see those and so if you ever do on an overcast day on an overcast day see some fluorescent dye. It could be fluorescent marker. It could be fluorescent vest that someone's wearing. Um, in fact, it could be uh, if you're in a club or something like that and you have these white lights on that they're emitting ultraviolet and then you're, even just the cotton in your shirt can re-emit a certain amount of visible and it appears that your white clothing is glowing. Um, and that's just because of this whole, this, this phenomenon here. And it's all based on transition in energy level and it's called uh, photoluminescence. Essence, sense. Okay, um, so so that's great. Again, the Bohr models helped us to explain this mechanism. Let me look at one other example, and we'll see that the Bohr model kind of falls a little short. Uh, and this is these the uh, sodium vapor um, street lights, sodium. Okay, they kind of they kind of give a yellowy color. You may have seen some around on lighting the streets. <clears throat> and if you analyze this yellow color um, carefully, as can be done, uh, you'd actually find that it's it's pretty close to uh, 589 nanometers. Okay, so then if we said, okay, let let's let's use our our model, our understanding of these shells, uh, where we've got you know n equals one, n equals two, n equals three from from uh, the and sort of extended version of the Bohr model, but the principle where there's just the concept where there's just one quantum number, you'd find that, that it was difficult to explain. In fact, you couldn't really find a matching that was that is what you needed. In fact, the transition that we'd be closest to would be somewhere between n equals three and n equals four, dropping down to n equals three. But that's a problem because we know that these intermediate levels in energy between each of these shells, each of these shells, is not allowed. So how can we have a transition in energy from one of these intermediate levels to, to one of the shells? It's, it's not, not possible. So the Bohr model can't explain that. And in fact, if you look really carefully at this wavelength, you'd find that there was actually two wavelengths. They're very close. Uh, to, to one another. <clears throat> it's known in spectroscopy as a doublet. There's two lines really close to each other. And so that doublet, again, could not be explained by these just these single shells given by n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, by these single, just, just by this principal quantum number, one quantum number. And so the Bohr model can't explain that. So to in order to explain this behavior, and, and I mean so many more um, Things that, that we understand uh, now about the the atom and the way that they behave, we need a more refined model. And so, in fact, 
our current level of understanding has four quantum numbers. So we need four quantum numbers <clears throat> to fully describe the energy levels of an atom. And that's what we're going to get into.